hospitals, no matter how important to society, will forever be associated by humans with a feeling of dread. A place that only holds good news when there is fear of bad news. And a place that has millions of people with different ages, ethnicities, and stories together to lose their lives. Walking through a hospital leaves most uneasy. And although some would say the reason for that is simply anxiety, others believe that the souls of those lost linger when they die. Therefore, leaving the halls of some hospitals fully packed with the ghosts of former patients. As usual, most of these claims are nothing more than speculation. But the line between speculation and reality fades when the hospital's history will definitely stain the land and make for one of the most haunted places in the world. This is the story of the Denver's State Hospital and the numerous cases of tortures, killings, and horror that have made this building infamous for its ghostly visitors. The Denver State Hospital was built in 1874 and officially opened its doors to patients in 1878. The building was designed by a prominent architect named Nathaniel Bradley, and its design gave the building a gothic and dark look, which may have claimed to be the inspiration for numerous horror enthusiasts or fanatics. Most notably, the building is claimed to have inspired H.P. Lovecraft's popular stories at Arkham Sanitarium. The gothic look of the building might have been what initially struck people with fear, but most believe Danvers' curse has nothing to do with its design, but its location. Danvers was built on none other than Hawthorne Hill, a site believed to have been cursed as a man named John Hawthorne, who led the Salem Witch Trials, lived there a few hundred years ago. Over the years, numerous stories of horror, ghosts, and mysterious deaths have come from the hospital. But this is about one story in particular. This is the story of my horrific experience at the cursed hospital called Danvers. My name is Jack Allen, and on the 13th of March, 1965, I was admitted to the Denver State Hospital. Growing up, I had always struggled with schizophrenia, but around the time I turned 19 years old, the illness got worse, and I was at the point where I couldn't tell reality from fantasy. My family at the time was far from stable. My father was a local politician who only cared about his job, and my mother had been put away in an asylum when I was younger. My illness had always been very public, and it didn't take long for my father to use it as a campaign strategy. He quickly announced to the news that he would admit his own son into the local mental asylum and ensure all facilities were up to date and the best in the world. The hospital ride to the hospital was extremely quiet. My father didn't have much to say to me as he had always looked at me differently ever since I was diagnosed. From a distance, I spotted the large frame of the hospital. The aura was completely different from anything I'd ever seen. We weren't close yet, but the eerie feeling the building gave was felt all the way from the car. Eventually, we were welcomed in. My father was greeted by the head doctor, and after they shook hands, he looked at me and said, Don't worry, son. You'll be all fixed up by the time you leave. After that, he showed me to my room, and my dad proceeded to shake my hand before leaving. My first few days at the hospital weren't entirely normal, but nothing extra out of the ordinary happened. Most of what I saw, I considered to be my schizophrenia. In the earlier days, the treatment the asylum prepared for me hadn't begun, and as such, I was allowed to roam the hospital for a couple of hours during the day. The hospital had two main buildings that housed four radiating wings and administration. On each side of the main building were wings that housed the male and female patients. Most patients were only allowed outside for a couple of minutes, and only a handful of them looked like they still had a grip on sanity. I eventually discovered patients who were deemed too far gone were being kept in the basement of the building. And rumor had it that all the corpses of patients who died were thrown in the tunnels underground. My treatment plan started the next week, and as it began, so did the real horrors of Danvers State Hospital. Now, I'm still not sure what happened, but my theory is my schizophrenia had served as a buffer and had somehow shielded me from what was really happening in the hospital. The more I took my medicine, the more I began to see and hear people I had no idea were in the hospital. As the days passed, the worse it became. I began seeing numerous patients aimlessly wandering the hall, most of them dressed in different types of clothes and hairstyles. What made everything about it even creepier was each new patient I saw was brutally mutilated in some way. 
Most of them had large holes in their heads from the lobotomies the hospital carried out, while some of them had slit wrists and marks covering their whole body. Their eyes looked empty as they walked the halls and stared at absolutely nothing. But even as strange as it was, things only seemed to get even worse at night. One particular night, I had sat in bed as I thought about what I could do to escape the horrific hospital I was now trapped in. My room was completely silent, and after a while, I began to drift off to sleep. Suddenly, I was awoken by the sound of a woman's screams filling my room. I opened my eyes immediately to see the ghastly figure of a woman tied up with her skin completely burnt. Her clothes were also burnt, but it was obvious I had never seen them before, and they were obviously from a time way before what I knew was modern clothing. Confusion and horror filled me that night, and as the woman kept screaming and pleading for help, I lay there frozen, not opening my eyes until morning, when as suddenly as she came, she disappeared. The days that followed after that only got worse, as the patients weren't only roaming aimlessly in the halls anymore. They began to wail and plead for attention and help from nurses who weren't there. My room wasn't safe either, as I had soon gone days without sleep, and every night I was visited by the ghost of a new patient. I had reached a point where I now understood what Denver's was and why it had the reputation it had. Not everyone who came into the hospital was completely mad, but either the hospital drove you insane or it killed you. But after days of contemplating my suicide, I decided I would rather die trying to escape than die and spend eternity roaming the halls of Denver's State Hospital. I spent the next two days thinking of how I would escape, and luckily, I remembered the tunnels I had discovered in my earlier days. Now, I didn't know where they led, but I knew tunnels in older buildings were usually kept as an escape in smuggling routes during the wars. My only hope was to get down there, and that's exactly what I did immediately after I was let out of my room. The nurses at the hospital were usually only seen when giving whatever treatment they had to the patients. At first, I wondered why. But after my experiences, I realized they too would have been driven crazy by the place. It didn't take long for me to get down to the tunnels, and almost immediately, I was met with the stench of rotting flesh and an atmosphere of complete dismay filling the air. I immediately threw up and reconsidered my actions, but those thoughts were quickly dismissed once I remembered the horror I was escaping from. The tunnels were covered in darkness, and I had no clue where I was headed, but I decided to walk and keep walking until I couldn't walk anymore. As I walked deeper into the tunnels, I realized it wasn't a straight line and there were multiple turns and dead ends, making it somewhat of a labyrinth. The more I walked, the stronger the stench, and soon enough, I was accompanied by the horrific residents of Danvers. The screams filled the dark tunnels, and it had now reached a point where the only way I could move was to feel the walls to avoid walking into them. I continued moving around for around 30 minutes and tears began to fill my eyes as the realization that I would die hit me. As I stood still crying, the wails of the dead got louder, and I couldn't even hear myself anymore. I could feel myself losing my mind as I hadn't slept. I couldn't breathe, and I couldn't see anything. I let out a scream and ran straight into the darkness, almost expecting to hit my head against the brick walls and die. Instead, I was met with an old wooden door that immediately broke apart once I came in contact with it. The door was extremely old and led into the woods almost a mile from Danvers, and the feeling of relief filled my body almost immediately. It didn't take long for me to reach the road and beg a local seller to lend me some clothes. After that, I got on a bus to Chicago, where I lived with my aunt in peace for the next three years. It took me two years to be able to speak after arriving at my aunt's. Fortunately, she was my mother's sister, so she took one look at me and knew I needed all the help I could get. She never rushed me, and after suffering from PTSD for a year, she took me to a psychologist who helped me begin speaking after another year. Nothing about my life has been easy since then, but I'm almost 80 years old, and I am ready to share my story with the world. People I've spoken to before believe the whole ordeal was a result of my schizophrenia. Others believe I was actually crazy and would have been better off staying at Danvers. But over the years, just a fraction of the truth about Danvers has slowly come out. The stories about my days in Danvers would send chills down the spine of anyone. But luckily, 
they would only have to hear the stories and not have to live it. I had to live it, and I would never wish my experiences on anyone. But believe me when I say Denver State Hospital is the most horrific place on earth. The story above is loosely based on a Reddit piece by an individual claiming to have spent a month at Denver's State Hospital. The details of his story, however, have since been verified by multiple patients and visitors to the hospital, with many claiming to have seen ghosts aimlessly roaming the halls and screaming for help. Danvers was notorious for carrying out lobotomies in which they drilled holes into patients' heads and had different inhumane methods of treating patients. The Danvers Hospital was destroyed in 2006, but many still claim the grounds and its surroundings still have ghosts roaming to this very day. Hello everyone, we are thrilled that you have been enjoying our videos. Your support means the world to us. If you've liked what you've seen, please consider liking and subscribing to our channel. We would love to hear which one of our videos is your favorite. We're on a mission to reach 100,000 members in the SSG family, and with your help, we can achieve that goal. Thank you for being a part of our journey. If you guys know what a traveling nurse is, then you must be familiar with the fact that traveling nurses work at a new hospital or medical facility every 13 weeks or 3 months on average. Being a traveling nurse is a stressful job. Familiarizing yourself with a new environment just to move to another one after a short while can take a toll on you. Hi, I'm Susan and I'm a traveling nurse. For the past 7 years, I have been a traveling nurse, traveling all over the U.S. treating patients. Now, let me tell you, for the past seven years, I have seen life and death closely on a daily basis. At first, it used to affect me when a patient lost their life, but after a while, I believe every doctor and nurse gets used to the cycle of life. But what scares me to date is what happens after death. I do not know if there is anything like an afterlife or not, but the one thing I'm sure of is that if there is an untimely death of a kid or a young individual, their souls can be trapped in this dimension rather than moving on. To prove this, I will tell you a haunted tale. Three years back, I was working in one of the most famous children's hospital in all of the U.S. I will not name this hospital for obvious reasons, but let's call it Hospital X for the time being. Now the patients admitted to this hospital and their relatives may not know this fact, but this hospital is haunted. Most of the staff members know it, and the day I joined this hospital, the head nurse and some of my fellow nurses told me that this hospital was haunted, and many staff members, as well as the patients, have seen or felt paranormal activities in some parts of the hospital. By then, I had four years of experience as a traveling nurse, and I had dealt with allegedly haunted hospitals before. Most of the time it was a fragment of a person's wild imagination. Some wind and some coincidences, nothing more that made a place haunted. I firmly believe that there was no such thing as a ghost until I started working at Hospital X. The initial few weeks were fine as all my shifts were morning shifts. I had to take care of kids with minor illnesses. It was a piece of cake, truly, as these kids were fun to work with. Although I had worked with kids before, that was my first time working at an only kids hospital. After the initiation period of two weeks, I was transferred to the ward where the terminally ill kids were placed. I and the other nurses were looking after some patients with leukemia, brain tumors, lung cancer, and whatnot. This ward had seen the greatest number of untimely deaths along with the operation theater. Although the doctors and the other staff were the best of the best, these kids were doomed due to their illnesses. Therefore, there was a gloomy atmosphere in this ward at all times. Rarely did people smile there. All the parents and relatives of the kids were crying or comforting the kids to the best of their abilities. There was a legend of sorts that a kid was critical and would not make it to the next day. A girl visited those kids and told them that everything was going to be okay and that the kids were going to a better place. I, of course, did not believe this and thought it must be a story made up by the staff to comfort the ill kids. 
One evening around eight, when the visiting hours was just over, I was checking up on a seriously ill boy. The boy had HIV from birth, and due to his ineffective immune system, he was on his deathbed. While I was checking on him, he waved his little hand to someone standing right behind me in the doorway. I knew that most kids here had been here for a while, and some of them had become friends with each other. So without turning around, I asked the boy who he was waving to. He said, I smiled at the boy, ruffled his hair, and he waved again. The boy was the only patient in the room, and at that moment, it was just me and him in there. When he waved the second time, I turned around, and there was no one standing in the doorway. Now the boy was smiling, but not at me, but rather at someone in the doorway. Who is it? I asked again. The boy looked at me puzzled and said, There was no girl. I made sure that he was okay and began to walk away from his room. That's when I heard the boy say his name, Stefan, in a very faint voice. I turned around, and now he was looking at something beside his bed. He was nodding his head as if someone was talking to him. He was smiling, and he even giggled once, something he hadn't done in a long time. I just stood there, watching the scene unfold. Then he squeezed his left fist as if he were holding someone's hand, and then nodded again, before closing his eyes and drifting off to sleep. I walked out of that room, blaming it on the crazy imagination of kids. My shift ended about an hour later, and I went home. The next morning when I returned from my morning shift, there were a lot of people, mostly doctors and nurses, in and around the kids' room. I spotted Simone, another fellow nurse who I ate lunch with, and asked her what was going on. She told me that the kid had passed away in his sleep last night. I was taken aback, because now I believe that the legend was true, and a girl did visit kids a day before their demise. The second incident happened a month after. This incident, and now, I had started to believe in the paranormal to some degree, but not fully. Around four weeks into my job in Hospital X, I was given the night shift. This shift was rotated amongst all staff members to not burden a single employee with the night shift. It started around nine in the evening and ended at six in the morning. To be awake throughout the night, I carried a small snack with me and drank a cup of coffee from the cafeteria. On every floor, there was a table arrangement in the center of the lobby for staff and visitors to eat or drink. It wasn't as big as the cafeteria downstairs, but rather a cozy spot to grab a quick bite. That night, my colleague, who shared the night shift with me, was on the round while I took my break and ate my snack. We often did this. I had a round a while ago when she took her break. Now, you must know that there are special rooms with two patients in them, and then there was a general ward. There were washrooms in the special rooms, but the kids in general ward had to go to washrooms by the end of the hallway. It was around 2.30 in the morning, and I had just taken a bite of my snack when a little girl walked out of the general ward looking for a nurse. The moment I spotted her, I placed my food in the paper bag and walked towards her. She was wearing the typical patient's gown with knots in the back and all. What happened? I asked her. She said she wanted to go to the washroom. I held her tiny hands in mine and led her to the end of the hallway. We entered the washroom, which was obviously empty at such an hour, and opened the first stall for her. I told her she need not lock the door, as I was standing just outside her stall, and would wait for her there. She nodded and walked in, and I closed the door behind her. I waited there for a minute, then two minutes. Two turned into five, and then some more. There was pin drop silence in there. I knocked on the door, and asked if she needed any help. I got no reply. Then I knocked again. No reply. Now, I was scared. Did something happen to her? Did she faint? Without wasting a second, I pushed open the door and fell back on my ass. There was no one inside. The stall was empty. Sweat trickled down my forehead and back, and my heart was a million beats a minute. I somehow managed to stand and ran away from there. Instead of looking for my partner, I ran directly to the ground floor into the cafeteria, as I knew most of the night staff would be there. As I entered the cafeteria, everyone looked at me like I was crazy. The head nurse rushed toward me, made me sit in a nearby chair, and offered me water. Then she asked me what had happened. 
Every pair of eyes in the room were on me. I controlled my breathing and told them what had happened. One of the male nurses, who had previously worked in the same ward as me, described the girl, and when I confirmed that the girl matched his description, he told me that he, too, had seen the girl. Apparently, many staff members had seen her at night or in the early morning asking for help. No one knew who the girl was or when she was treated in the hospital. After that, I started believing in ghosts and the paranormal. And after that day, I began counting my days until I moved to the next hospital. I had also heard kids' laughter and giggles from wards which were shut down and locked. But after a while, I, like all the other staff members, became immune to all those things.